So I uh, hope my uh, presentation is visible. Ah, yes, it is yes, visible. So good evening to all, all the participants or students who are present here. This is Dipshika Brahma, a pre-final year undergraduate in the field of uh, ceramic engineering in IIT Rorkela. And today in this technical session, I'll be speaking on the topic, a uh, new implementation of various forms of carbons in refractories. So this topic was somehow a part of my project in Women of Metal Tata Steel. So I would love to introduce you uh, with this topic. So before jumping into the depth of this topic, I'll be introducing you with the basic uh, things related to the properties of carbon, properties of refractory, what a refractory is, and some basic terminologies. So moving into the next slide. So when we uh, think about refractories, so what are refractories? Like what kind of a material is it? So this all questions may arise in your mind. Just starting from the very basic, ceramic technology is one of the ancient of all the technologies. It is around more than 24,000 years old and at the same time is the most modern and dynamically developing field. Ceramic materials may be in the form of cement, glasses, enamels, porcelain or sanitary wires uh, have responded to the fundamental human needs by providing building materials for shelter, pots for cooking and various other applications too. Among the different classes of ceramics, refractories are the materials which, uh, which can withstand high temperature and under a high load. In other words, these are the heat resistant materials which comprises the lining of the high temperature furnaces and reactors and some other processing units. So these all materials are resistant to thermal stress or any thermal energy related phenomenon. In addition to that, it can also withstand a uh, high load and thermal shocks. What is the meaning of thermal shock here? Like if you sub, if you uh, take a body and subject it to various thermal cycles and for, suppose you uh, take a body and then you uh, uh, keep it in a condition at 1600 degrees centigrade. And again, you bring back to it at a normal environmental condition. Then these all temperature fluctuations result in the thermal shock. So a refractory must withstand that. You know, like if you take the example of a blast furnace, here you line that with various refractory, like various refractory bricks. So a blast furnace has got many sections. So in different sections, you can line with different type of refractories. Like in the two year section, you can line with magnesia carbon refractories. In the upper section, you can line with carbon bricks. So these all kind of bricks are subjected to various thermal conditions. Like when you charge the materials, those materials are 1600 degrees centigrade. You take out the molten iron at 1100 or 1200 degrees centigrade. And again, when you switch off the blast furnace, it may uh, the temperature may fall down to around 500, 600 degrees centigrade. So these are temperature fluctuations a refractory must withstand. Otherwise, it will deteriorate the entire furnace and you have to change the refractory lining again, which is very much cost effective. This is not at all economical. So refractories are built in such a way that it is very economical and you do not need to replace it again and again. So refractories are the backbone of the industry. Why? Because these are essentially required to support the production of all the basic and essential commodities manufactured at high temperatures like iron and steel, aluminum and many other materials too. So uh, these are, are the properties of refractories which I'll be explaining you one by one. Refractories you know have the two basic features. These are high temperature withstandability that means it should have a very high melting point and high strength at high temperature. That is obvious. If the refractory corrode or degrade at very high temperatures, then what's the point of lining the entire furnace with those refractory bricks? It has got no point. So it should have very high strength at high temperature. The first point which is mentioned here is high volume stability. What does that mean? See, when you heat a material, the body expands, right? But if you heat the furnace, like the furnace is heated, and if the refractory bricks expand, 
then what will happen it cannot uh, you can uh, you think that uh, there will be some internal stresses developed if the refractory beaks start to expand then there will be deviation from their dimensions and it may result in the failure of the refractories so this happens because of the prolonged and repeated use of refractories at high temperatures which may result in some dimensional changes and due to the structural adjustment which may cause the deviation from their dimensions and will result in the um, failure of the refractories so a very high volume stability is essentially required to support the furnace or any high temperature furnaces uh, or ladles so next point mentioned here is uh, it has to withstand the action of molten metal slag glass and hot gases yes the furnaces are continuously fed with various materials like uh, in a blast furnace we put some iron ore then followed by coke which is a reducing agent we may give some other binders like uh, other um, antioxidants or flux like calcium oxide that is a line so refractory has to face all this type of materials you know uh, like refractories are lined inside the furnace so it has to bear all these things any high temperature processing uh, involves certain chemicals and these chemicals may vary with their acidity or basicity basicity so the refractories has to withstand such chemical environments and should have excellent corrosion resistance all the processes are generally like any process may it be iron reduction or you know steel oxidation like to refine the steel these all things are uh, necessarily supplied with some uh, input materials and to get the desired product hence refractories are also associated with the continuous flow of uh, this charge and the product these materials may be solid liquid gas or anything and these materials can be fed like continuously or batch wise so like it has to withstand the corrosion due to this all these materials it has to withstand the continuous flow of the materials like it should have high corrosion and high abrasion resistance abrasion in the sense it is the wear and tear of the refractory so if the refractory do not have high abrasion resistance then it cannot bear the continuous flow of materials charge or products so refractory must uh, must be having some uh, ex, uh, must be having a good uh, abrasion and corrosion resistance refractories are uh, generally affected by the movement of these materials and uh, require excellent resistance against abrasion erosion and wear it should have next point is it should have excellent thermal properties which i have already told like it should have very high melting point and should have high strength at such high temperatures then coming to the next point it has to withstand high temperatures and even under high load so excellent mechanical property is required uh, at elevated temperatures so that refractory can bear the high load apart from this it should have a very low thermal expansion yes the, it is related to the first point only like high volume stability you know different refractory bricks has got different expansion properties which will change the overall uh, dimension of the refractory lining and it may result in thermal strain stress or crack so because of this the thermal shock resistance property will be affected i have already introduced with the term thermal shock that is uh, continuously subjecting the body to thermal cycles like heating and cooling cycles so that is thermal shock hence to have a very good thermal shock resistance a refractory should have very low thermal expansion and high thermal conductivity yes very interesting thing is high thermal conductivity what do you guys think like a refractory should have high thermal conductivity or low thermal conductivity like anyone can you respond like any one of you uh, low to low right so uh, this thing is quite confusing here a refractory should have uh, like low thermal conductivity yes it should have low thermal conductivity indeed so as to prevent the uh, inside heat of the furnace to go outside so if uh, the refractory has low thermal conductivity it will not allow the hot uh, gases to uh, move outside the furnace like you know the brick if the bricks are joined uh, there will be some gap within the bricks so hot gases can pass through that 
and it will move out to the environment and the inside temperature of the furnace will continuously fall down and it will affect the processing okay so in this if we see in this type of thing then it should have low thermal conductivity and a high thermal conductivity is also required you know why because the primary purpose uh, like uh, the low thermal conductivity is required to avoid this um, like uh, temperature uh, like a heat diffusion but if there is a low thermal conductivity what will happen it will produce a high thermal gradient okay like if uh, inside temperature will become means hot like in out the inside it will not go out then the obviously the inside furnace will become hot and outside uh, atmospheric condition is comparatively at a lower temperature so that will result in a very high thermal gradient one for one surface facing the high temperature and another for another surface facing the atmospheric temperature so this huge temperature gradient will result in thermal shock and cracking of the refractory but we don't need that right this thermal shock and cracking will obviously deteriorate the property of refractory so uh, like in this case we also have we also need a high thermal conductivity so that this thermal gradient will not be maintained so in order to have a good thermal shock resistance property refractory should have low thermal expansion and high thermal conductivity now coming to my next topic here like carbon forms and refractory so before when that one more thing i would like to mention like this refractories are made from solid granular masses okay like you you all must have read about like those who are in second year you all must have read about solid state sintering process so while making the refractory we do the same thing like this solid state sintering is followed because in any ceramics we do not add uh, like for refractories specifically we do not add water like this liquid phase sintering is not at all applicable here so if we mix this solid state there will be the presence of porosity so refractory is inherited with porosity like whenever they are made they they are having some porosity and that results in poor strength but this porosity is also necessary why because pores are filled with air and air are thermal insulators okay so that will uh, result in uh, like good efficiency of any process the furnace efficiency will increase if this pores are present so having some amount of um, small and continuous porosity is also necessary here now uh, the beautiful thing is uh, carbon okay the my topic uh, deals with carbon only and i'll be speaking about the two forms of carbon here that is graphene and graphite mostly because all other things are not uh, uh, quite convenient in this uh, session so i'll be introducing with this topics mostly like you all are quite acquainted of this carbon forms like carbon allotropes like graphite graphite graphene nanotubes buckminster fuller and then diamond and all so i'll be speaking about first graphene here you can see the first picture like this where if you if you can see my cursor here i'll take the pointer this picture so the uh, like arrangement is like hexagonal tiling like these are all hexagonal uh, uh, what we can say shapes and these are tiled in this uh, hexagonal lining uh, hexagonal tiling structure and this hexagon has got six corner points okay if we put carbon atoms there then it will form graphene like if we put all the carbon atoms in the six corners of the hexagon it will form the uh, graphene okay then you can say here like why this yellow dots and black dots what does that signify see like we have read if if uh, if you put the carbon atom in any corner of a unit cell it will become a lattice point we generally put the atom in the lattice point right but this graphene all the six points are not uh, lattice points that is interesting why because lattice point is sometimes is defined if this latin lattice if all the lattice points if all these points are equivalent to one another if the points are equivalent to one another then only that uh, particular point can be defined as a lattice point if you take this item item like carbon atom where i where i have pointed with a laser pointer this uh, this carbon atom has got a right hand side neighbor okay this carbon atom has got a right hand side neighbor and this also has got a right hand side neighbor but if you take this atom this does not have a right hand side neighbor so this carbon atom is not uh, like uh, similar to this carbon atom so these all lattice points are not similar 
similarly this black carbon atom and this black carbon atom we take only those points only the, uh, these carbon atoms as lattice points we do not consider all the six points as lattice points so if we join like this four lattice points it will form a rhombus so the unit cell of a graphite graphene is a rhombus cell a rhombus unit cell okay this is not a hexagon this is a rhombus rhombus unit cell and if you see inside the rhombus there is a carbon atom here this carbon atom is lying on the face of the basal plane this graphene is a two dimensional network structure two dimensional hexagonal network structure having a rhombus unit cell having the unit cell in the shape of rhombus and one carbon atom on the face of the basal plane it is not face centered cubic it is just one of the face of the basal plane that to not on the center this is lying in this side not on the center okay so this is one thing and this rhombus has got two edges a and b where a and b are equal because of the simple geometry thing which we know and the angle between them is 120 degree so if we relate this carbon carbon bond length is d and this age length as a we can relate with this expression a equals to 2d cos theta by geometrical calculation that is a equals to root 3d where carbon carbon bond length is 1.42 armstrong and a will come out as 2.46 armstrong so this is what a graphene structure is now if we stack this graphene structure in a three dimensional packing in the form of ab ab sequence then we can get graphite it is a misconception that the second layer lies just above the first layer of the graphite no the second layer is shifted to a some distance it is not lying just above the first layer so take this structure the black dots and black uh, structure which we can see is the basal structure like the basal plane the first first plane okay so this black one is the first plane the second red one is the second plane this red one is the second plane and if we take the projection if we think that the second plane is just lying above that but no it is shifted to a certain distance which is equal to the carbon carbon bond length okay this distance which it is shifted it is the carbon carbon bond length and the structure is hexagonal this first sequence if we define is at a then the second will be b third will be a and b so this is ab ab hexagonal stacking sequence and again if we see the unit cell the basal plane will be having a rhombus because what is graphite that graphene uh, unit cells are only stacked together no the unit cell here also is graphite here you can see the graphite structure the base is of the rhombus unit cell okay base is the rhombus unit cell now uh, in the graphite structure there are basically two group of carbon atoms like if we concentrate on this black circle okay concentrate on this black circle if we move at a certain distance like in the second layer this red is the second layer imagine that like if we move uh, from this black carbon atom to the vertically upward direction then we can find another carbon atom here like the red one okay this red one we can find in the another second layer if we move vertically upward uh, from this black carbon atom but if we take uh, like you know uh, this black carbon atom if we move vertically upward we cannot find the next carbon atom we will find the next carbon atom in the third in the third stacking okay not in the second stacking so this makes like the, this makes the differentiation between the two group of carbon atoms one in which there is another carbon atom uh, just lying above in the second layer and in the another carbon atom the next nearest neighbor is not found like motif means what that well, like what kind of thing is repeated in the entire structure that is the carbon atoms this has four carbon atoms how just uh, see this ha huh, the graphene has got uh, two motif okay the motif is two because this yellow uh, circles like yellow carbon atoms will comprise of one carbon atom you all know by uh, like solid solid uh, you know solid chemistry which we have read in 12th by that geometrical stipulation uh, this four carbon atoms will contribute to one carbon atom and this black carbon atom lying in the face center will contribute for another carbon atom so motif is 2 and in graphite the motif is 4 see here like the eight carbon atoms this four and the upper four will contribute for one carbon atom okay the face center here black and this black will contribute for another carbon atom this middle center like not just the body center but somehow in the Uh, inside this cube inside this um, 
structure of graphite this will contribute for third carbon atom and this four one two this three and this four one two three four this will contribute for another carbon atom or total four carbon atoms forms the motif motif like a crystal structure is defined in terms of lattice and motif lattice is how how it is repeated like how the things are repeated okay and motif is what is repeated so carbon atoms repeated in a simple hexagonal lattice will comprise of the graphite crystal structure okay graphite crystal structure so this was about the graphite and moving to my next topic role of graphite yeah so the form of carbon which is uh, in, in, in included in the refractory is the flaky graphite so before moving to the graphite uh, thing like all the refractories do not have carbon okay don't be confused there are various type of refractories and there are some carbon bearing refractories okay so this uh, graphite are inculcated in the graphite in the carbon containing refractories like mac car mag uh, magnesia carbon refractory then comes the um, what we can say amc aluminium magnesia carbon refractory there are some others also so flaky graphite which is included in as a form of carbon in that uh, refractory it is the graphite only it is the graphite one only but having a flaky morphology like there are flakes you understand like these are pointed flakes and this flaky graphite is included in the refractory okay so what happens if we add graphite in the refractory like you know flaky graphite are very fine materials and if we add the refractory if another suppose there are three four raw materials which are used to make the refractory suppose take the example of magnesia carbon refractory the raw materials are magnesia then flaky graphite then resins resins are i'll be explaining you in the next slide and then we add uh, like any antioxidants okay if we add flaky graphite there if, and we, i have already discussed like solid state sintering we add two three raw materials and then mix that so if we add flaky graphite it will fill in all the pores of the uh, raw materials like if we mix the magnesia magnesia thing then there will be some pores in it and if we add flaky graphite it will fill all the pores not all but maximum pores will be filled by graphite and it will completely make the structure dense and compact graphite as you always have known that it is the sp2 hybridized carbon atom and carbon has four electrons but three electrons are satisfied so one unpaired electron is there so this uh, unpaired electrons will result in the high thermal conductivity high thermal spalling resistance why because high thermal conductivity is there and thermal spalling is same as thermal shock resistance okay don't get confused and the necessity requirement for a high thermal shock resistance is high thermal conductivity and low thermal expansion so graphite has high thermal conductivity and low thermal expansion these two things will result in high thermal spalling resistance then corrosion resistance yes corrosion resistance of the refractory brick will improve why because uh, graphite is a hydrophobic material it has got non wetting property like you have read in the uh, physics chapter of class 11 like contact angle and thing if contact angle is more than 90 degree then the thing then that liquid is a non wetting one okay similarly graphite forms a uh, contact angle of more than 90 degree uh, with any any of these uh, you can think like any of these slag okay if we put uh, like raw materials in a blast furnace the product which we get is uh, molten iron and slag so like the bricks refractory bricks have gaps in it and this slag can penetrate inside the bricks and it will affect the brick property so if the graphite is a non wetting one like it will a hydrophobic one it will not allow the slag and a molten iron to penetrate inside the refractory bricks and ultimately it will improve the corrosion okay corrosion in the sense uh, the damage which is caused to the refractory because of these chemicals and all so that will be prevented if we add a non wetting uh, graphite yes porous structure that is a major you can say drawback of adding the flaky graphite here carbon has a oxidizing property like at high temperature it will oxidize to form carbon monoxide and dioxide and if it oxidizes out then what will happen that pores will be vacant again and ultimately the refractory will be highly porous graphite has got a low modulus of elasticity okay then it will absorb all the thermal expansion and thermal volume expansion so it will continue it will uh, what we can say is the discontinuous wear due to cracks will also decrease if if the graphite is included in the refractory because of the low modulus of refractory 
similar thing is mentioned here in the form of graph like addition of the graphite increases the thermal conductivity graphite has a low young's modulus of elasticity so adding that to the refractory will decrease the young's modulus of elasticity similarly corrosion proper uh, corrosion resistance will increase and hence the slag cannot penetrate so depth of the slag penetration also decreases so in this graph like corrosion index versus carbon content up to 20 percent carbon the corrosion index decreases okay corrosion index decreases because carbon has a non wetting property and it will not allow the slag or molten metal to penetrate inside it but after 20 percent carbon what will happen this uh, corrosion index will increase again because like at high percentage of carbon carbon will start oxidizing okay the pores will be uh, again bracketing itself so if the carbon content is reduced, if carbon content is increasing and it will be oxidizing out, then what will happen? That pores will be vacant and again the slag and metal can penetrate. So up to 20% carbon, it is convenient to be added in refractory. Okay, flaky graphite is very cheap and economical and hence it can be added. Okay, now moving next. Um, binders and antioxidants so this thing is quite interesting and i'll be speaking a little about this also binders as the name suggests used to bind something okay the raw materials if we mix it uh, see carbon is a hydrophobic property uh, hydrophobic material we cannot add water and we can mix the raw materials okay that will that cannot happen we cannot mix only so water is not uh, added I have said that solid state centering is followed and we cannot add water. But if we use a binder which is having water like clay, clay is a good binder, good, good plasticizer. If we add that clay containing material which has got water, the formula is Al2O3.2SiO2.2H2O, that is kaolinite. If we add that, the water content will not allow the materials to be mixed properly. So what we need is a carbonaceous materials. Okay. If the refractory contains carbon, we cannot add this plasticizers like clay and all because this contains water. So what we need are the carbonaceous materials like tar and peach were the primarily used organic binder. Okay, but during the curing or tempering stage, you know, refractories, the process is like you mix the raw materials. Okay, then you can uh, what we can see is um, mix the raw materials, then add the antioxidants. Okay then dry it then age it age it means keep it in a controlled temperature then you can press it, press it then shape it then temper it temper is uh, low temperature heat treatment okay we cannot heat the refractory at a such a like we cannot press the refractory shape it and then heat it at a furnace of 1600 degrees centigrade no that that we cannot do because we should supply to the uh, user at such a condition that it is applicable to be uh, used again and again by the for, by, by the what we can say industry so we should uh, temper it like we cannot deteriorate the property of refractory because it is uh, like pressed uh, the if the refractories are manufactured now we should press it and then we temper it at low temperature like 200 or 300 degrees centigrade so that the volatile matters come out quickly and we can uh, just then supply to the user of the industry okay we temper it not we cannot fire it or something we just curing or tempering is followed curing and tempering are the same thing so if we add this carbonaceous materials like see the binding agents which i mentioned here is peach tar phenolic resins and all but i'll be focusing with this first three peach tar and phenolic resins okay so peach tar are the primarily used organic binder so during curing or tempering stage this carbon carbon network will be um, affected and this tar or peach bonded refractories will produce a huge amount of toxic gases like uh, uh, carcinogenic materials and all like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or uh, that is pah and bap benzo alpha pyrenes these all things will be liberated Hence, we started using phenolic resins. Okay, phenolic resins, these are two types again, thermoplastic resins and thermosetting and resins. The viscosity of resins also varies with uh, seasons to season. So we mix both thermoplastic and thermosetting resins. It is novel like and resolve. And we then uh, supply this as a good binding agent. Okay, phenolic resins, uh, has got good advantages. Like it has got a good chemical affinity to graphite so it will be dispersed in the matrix phase easily then it has got a good adhesive property binder means it will bind another thing like it will bind the raw materials so it should have a good adhesive property so it has got that 
toxic gas evolution is prevented and phenol is re uh, released instead of this poly uh, like what you can say polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon and instead of that phenol is uh, liberated which is not uh, toxic and then it has got a high amount of fixed carbon so binding agent these things are good the picture that is blue color here these are the resins phenolic uh, resins okay then think about the binding agents and castables what are castables see there are two type of refractories based on the physical form of shape or shape like these are refractory bricks and castables bricks are like they are having a particular shape size like in the form of a brick which you see in your construction site and all and this castables like if you take a particular material and that particular uh, material has got a matrix face and there we add some another additives and all and then we take out it as a complete single lining single lining not uh, having any proper shape these are not cut or given a proper shape and all these are just coming out as a uh, single lining you know you mix the raw material dry it and age it do not shape or press it you can press it but you do not shape it and then temper it so that is castable so castables are um, like you know why we can why castables are having a better um, you know use instead of bricks because if you um, lens means if you make a refractory lining you have to use a refractory cement to means ghar mein jab tum log ghar banate ho to kya karte ho bricks ko matlab kaise join karte cement ki cement ki tarah na to refractory bricks if you need to line it you have to add some refractory cement and then make it a layer 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 and then you can line the uh, line this uh, furnace okay but if instead there are some gaps present in between the bricks and that will result in what hot gases can uh, come out of the furnace and, and inside temperature will decrease so if you have a single lining instead of this bricks so this heat loss will be prevented so nowadays castables are replacing this bricks and still this will be continuing and it will have a great impact in this industries okay then in castables the binding agent used are plastic clay and alumina cement like earlier days we used to have plastic cement like plastic clay uh, sorry plastic clay this is a binder Uh, for unshaped refractory and this plastic nature will retain this shape the stickiness will be increased and the strength will be improved and densification behavior will also increase but high water requirement and shrinkage uh, these are the draw water like if you add plastic clay you need to add water and all so this will result in the poor hot properties of bricks if you add more amount of water in it then it will not be having that much strength okay So, मतलब जैसे होता ना कि हम लोग का घर में जो सीमेंट बनाते हैं उसमें तुम लोग ज्यादा जितना भी पानी डालो तो क्या करते हैं मतलब रहता है ज्यादा स्ट्रॉन्ग बनता है वो सीमेंट जितना भी पानी डाल के उन लोग को भिगाते हो ना मतलब सीमेंट नया नया लगता है तो पानी डालते हो तो वो ब्रिक्स मतलब वो सीमेंट स्ट्रॉन्ग होता है पर ये रिफ्रैक्टरी में ऐसा करोगे तो नहीं होगा बिकॉज रिफ्रैक्टरी इज टू बी यूज इन हाई टेम्परेचर कंडीशन इफ यू एड मोर अमाउंट ऑफ वाटर इन इट देन दिस हॉट टेम्परेचर प्रॉपर्टी विल बी रिड्यूस्ड सो प्लास्टिक क्ले हैज बीन लाइक डिमिनिश एंड एलुमिना सीमेंट is being used as a binding agent in castable this alumina cement in the earlier days it used it is having it was having 50% alumina but nowadays this um, uh, amount of alumina is increased because uh, in in alumina cement the formula is generally like alumina cement have calcium oxide and alumina okay you will be reading that uh, this thing in your apd uh, application of phase diagram in your fifth semester alumina cement ranges from one molecule of calcium oxide and one molecule of aluminum oxide to one molecule of calcium oxide and six molecules of aluminum oxide ca like one molecule of calcium oxide and one molecule of aluminum oxide to ca6 one molecule of calcium oxide and six molecules of aluminum oxide this is the range of alumina cement so alumina content has been increased because you know lime cannot be used to make a refractory brick because lime ka property tum log jante ho it will decompose caco3 Uh, cao like it is a um, sorry not cso3 cao like it will take up the water uh, from the atmospheric uh, from the atmosphere and it will form caoh cold 2 so as if this will happen then volumetric expansion will happen and uh, what will happen you know that refractory structure property everything will change so to avoid that the amount of alumina was increased is increased and being used now also okay the alumina cement having more than 50% alumina is used in as a binding agent in castable talking about the antioxidants what are that like carbon has got oxidation property i have told you like if we uh, 
means what we can say uh, if we um, um, keep the refractory like containing carbon in the atmospheric oxygen and all so it will oxidize and pores will be coming back again but we don't want that so we add antioxidants okay antioxidants are the materials which will oxidize faster and prevent the carbon oxidation so the most commonly used antioxidants are aluminum and silicon okay aluminum and silicon are the most commonly used antioxidants in the industry but uh, like give me some uh, like i'll be uh, telling you the mechanism of aluminum here so uh, sorry i forgot to mention here this picture is of the alumina cement okay this is the alumina cement and this picture i'll be explaining now if you take the antioxidant aluminum okay it will oxidize to form what aluminum oxide al2o3 this aluminum oxide if you take if you add aluminum oxide suppose if you take the aluminum antioxidant and add it in magnesia carbon refractory so mag the magnesia carbon refractory has got mgo the formed al2o3 will react with mgo to form this spinel okay this spinel what it will do it will fill in all the pores it will cover up all the graphite it will cover up the graphite um, present in the magnesia carbon refractory thus preventing the carbon oxidation means it will form a lining uh, in this uh, refractory and it will prevent the oxidation okay so this is the role of antioxidant here but sometimes this aluminum oxide reacts with carbon present like it will react with the graphite present in the magnesia carbon refractory to form aluminum carbide al4c3 it will also improve the high strength property of the refractory take this uh, example here this shell is the aluminum oxide shell like if you add the antioxidant it will oxidize and form the aluminum oxide this is the shell from which alu molten aluminum is coming out okay this is the shell from which molten aluminum is coming out here and this molten aluminum what it will do it will react with the carbon to form aluminum carbide which will improve the high strength property so this is the aluminum carbide formed this is the complete aluminum carbide here now uh, see here what it is mentioned like depth of the corrosion groove like means if we take pure magnesia carbon refractory instead of adding any antioxidant then the corrosion property will be there like carbon will oxidize then the pores will be present and then the slag and metal all can infiltrate in the pure magnesia carbon but see here the minimum corrosion here is in presence of magnesia carbon aluminum and boron compound yes b4c boron carbide is the best antioxidant but it is not applicable or it is not being used in the industries because boron has got many detrimental properties so some amount of aluminum and boron carbide is used and it is the best antioxidant okay these are all tested in in the labs but still needs to be implemented in industry by some additions by some extra things and all so aluminum and boron carbide what does boron carbide do boron carbide oxidizes it will form b2o3 this b2o3 will react with magnesia magnesium oxide present in the magnesia carbon refractory this will form like mgo plus b2o3 will form a low melting liquid like mg3b2o6 this liquid will fill in the pores of the refractory and form a lining in the refractory thus preventing the carbon to be exposed to the atmospheric oxygen so carbon aluminum has uh, like aluminum and boron carbide uh, this has got the best antioxidant property and like why not only aluminum why boron carbide Let's see aluminum antioxidant has got some uh, very uh, what we can say disadvantage okay it has got some disadvantage like i have said now this is the molten aluminum carbide formed this aluminum carbide may react with water at high temperature okay like if it will react with water at high temperature then it will form aluminum hydroxide aloh hole 3 which has got what volume expansion property so this volume expansion property will again deteriorate the refractory structure and property so we don't want that okay so it is quite taken into consideration how much to add aluminum aluminum and all so this thing needs to be considered here now this is hot mor and carbon content what is mor that is modulus of rupture okay modulus of rupture uh, modulus of rupture in the sense i'll be showing that in next slide see here this is ccs and this is modulus of rupture let me first explain that this is the refractory sample okay cylindrical shaped refractory sample if you apply the load in it and there are two supports here this is termed as 
three point bending load test. If you apply the load here, then if you bend the refractory, the amount of bending load which it can withstand is the modulus of rupture of the refractory. Like the amount of bending load it can withstand is the modulus of rupture. Hot MOR, this is CMOR. This is that means it is carried out in cold condition. And HMOR is nothing but this modulus of rupture carried out in hot condition. Okay. This was that. So previous slide, what it is shown, like if you add the antioxidant, like this is the graph in presence of antioxidant, the modulus of rupture has got um like it has got a higher value instead of like uh, like if you add the refractory without the antioxidant this modulus of rupture has got a lower value so what we need is like the modulus of rupture should be more or not like uh, refractory should withstand the bending load or not so we need antioxidant that will improve the hot modulus of rupture this is ccs means cold crushing strength cold crushing strength means load bearing capacity of a refractory this is the cubic sample having the area A and these are the load points. If you press this refractory sample, this is the load bearing capacity of a refractory. Okay, this is the coal crushing strength. Fine. So these are the terminologies which we'll be dealing in the next part. Apparent porosity means what? Like these are the pores which are present on the surface of the refractory, that is surface porosity. There are closed pores which are present inside the refractory sample also. Then there is bulk density. Bulk density means what? Mass per unit volume. Which volume? That is bulk volume. There are two volumes. True volume and bulk volume. True volume is what? Like we, we consider the refractory sample. We take the volume, but we subtract it with the volume of porosity. That is the only solid volume we take. That is the true volume. And bulk volume is solid volume plus volume of porosity. Now coming to the main topic like new implementations of carbon nanocarbons first see here I have taken five samples T1, T2, T3, T4, T5 and then there is T6 but the figure is not there. T1 is having 0% carbon 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 0 0.9, 1.2 and then T66 1.5. This is the SEM image. SEM you will be reading about in the next semester. Okay, so I will not speak about this SEM, FESM and all. Okay, so SEM stands for scanning electron microscope. So you can uh, scanning, these are things are very depth wise. You, can, you will be studying it in the uh, your next semesters. Just think that this is the microscopic structure of a nanocarbon. Okay, nanocarbon as the name suggests, these are very fine materials in the form of nano range and they disperse completely distribute evenly in the matrix and it will like if it, it will be distributed evenly then what it will result it will uh, it will result in the reduced thermal conductivity it will produce a very high strength and low expansion property oxidation resistance will increase and and the material will be highly useful okay flaky graphite you know like if we add this uh, flaky graphite in in the raw materials of refractory this flaky graphite cannot fill all the spaces but if we add nanocarbons it can fill in means 95 to 98 percent of the spaces can be filled if we add na nanocarbons suppose and if we add flaky graphite then 80 to 85 percent of the porosity will be filled up this is just an assumption this is not a correct value okay then uh, another thing is uh, what we can say mm, using the nanocarbon it minim it minimizes the size of the pores and thus improves the corrosion property also because if all the pores will be filled up the slag or molten metal cannot infiltrate and the corrosion resistance property will also increase now we will be seeing the effect of adding nanocarbons and the features like how does the cold crushing strength and all these things will in means uh, affected when we add nanocarbons T1 has got 0% carbon. First, we will be speaking about bulk density. The bulk density of the nanocarbon that is T1, 0% carbon has got 3.06 around value. Okay. And at T4, which is having how much? 0.9% nanocarbon has got 3.12 uh, gram per centimeter cube of bulk density. Because if we increase the nanocarbon content, it will, for, it will fill up the pore volume okay but if we continuously increase this nanocarbon what it will happen like if you have a bucket full of balls okay you have filled it with uh, what we can say maximum amount of balls possible and if you add more and more amount of small balls what it will happen the volume will increase suppose uh, see uh, what we can say the density will increase okay that is the same thing if we add more and more amount of carbon density will increase 
But similarly, if we add more than 0.9% carbon, the bulk volume will also increase. Okay, the bulk volume will, will be increasing. You take an open space. If we suppose take a, a marble tile in your um, home, okay, you add some amount of balls in it. The amount of space which is covering, if you add more amount of balls, then the volume will be more. This bulk volume will increase. And hence what will happen volume increases and bulk density decreases up to a certain percentage of carbon the bulk density increases and after that the bulk density starts decreasing here so after 0.9 percent carbon the bulk density decreases similarly ccs i've just mentioned here that is load bearing capacity up to t4 0.9 percent carbon the cold crushing strength increases this is because the pores are completely filled and compaction densification high strength value increases after that 0.9 percent carbon there is not much change in the cold crushing strength because increasing the nanocarbon percentage does not affect this strength property and all okay so there is not much change here then hmor which i have mentioned also up to 0.9 percent carbon the hot modulus of rupture is increasing uh, till 0.9% carbon and remains almost constant after that. Okay, with increasing the nanocarbon content, better filling as well as compaction has occurred, resulting in the better strength. Again, nanocarbon being very reactive, what it does, uh, it will form a carbide on the reaction with metal additives. Okay, it will form carbide. This nanocarbons will form carbide, like aluminum has formed carbide in antioxidants. Similarly, nanocarbons is very reactive and it will form carbide and carbide formation has got very high strength. So hot modulus of rupture is not decreasing even after uh, addition of more amount of carbon nanocarbons. In oxidized, okay, in up to T4, 0.9% carbon, um, the uh, what we can say nanocarbon is very reactive as I have said here, said here because of the carbide formation and all up to 0.9% carbon, the amount of oxidation is uh, what we can amount of um, up to 0.9 percent carbon the amount of oxidation is decreasing because all the pores are filled and this carbides which are formed it will form a lining on the refractory surface and hence oxygen cannot come in contact and hence oxidation is decreasing here but above 0.9 percent carbon this uh, nanocarbon is also starting to uh, oxidize and uh, so oxidation is also increasing here so this nanocarbons are being used in the industry. Okay, these are being being used, but we are not adding it in a much amount. We are mixing some amount of flaky graphite and we are adding 0.3 or 0.6 percent of nanocarbons, and then we are making it using it in the refractory. These are still very expensive and are used in some uh, economical processes, processes and all like very sensitive processes. It is being used. Flaky graphite is the most commonly used form of carbon in industry right now expanded graphite so expanded graphite what does that mean uh, like see i have missed out one point here this nanocarbon see this image okay these are the samples measured for the slag corrosion test there are several types of slag corrosion test you take a refractory sample okay you cut it like this you cut it like this and you keep the slag for a certain time. This is the static cup method. You make it in the shape of a cup and you fill it with a slag. After a certain time, you can see the slag will start penetrating. The amount of air, like the area, uh, the amount of area which the slag has penetrated, it will give the amount of corrosion property. Okay, so if we increase the carbon percentage up to this, the amount of corrosion decreases. Okay, the slag penetration has decreased. So if the pores are completely filled, then the slag cannot penetrate and hence the slag corrosion property improve. Then talking about the expanded graphite. Expanded graphite is a very promising material. You take the graphite structure and then it has got a very expanded um, uh, nature. Like if you, this is the, these are the SCM images of expanded graphite. Expanded graphite is prepared by rapidly hitting the graphite intercalation compounds. Intercalation compounds in the cells, some impurities which are present in the graphitic structures. So if you hit that, it will result in the ejection or decomposition of these molecules and subsequently unidirectional expansion of these uh, graphite structures are formed. This expanded graphite has got um, very light weight and uh, this, uh, uh, the layers between these uh, graphene layers has been increased and exposed. So these are the expanded graphite. These are very fine and lightweight materials. 
see with addition of the uh, graphite expanded graphite here in this graph up to b3 okay up to b3 the apparent uh, sorry like um, if we add more and more amount of uh, expanded graphite this b1 b2 b3 are the samples with increasing amount of expanded graphite okay the apparent porosity ranges from uh, 3.02 3.02 to maximum of 5% apparent porosity this like b4 has got the lowest amount of apparent porosity 3.02 so there is a decrease in the apparent porosity this is because the expanded graphite fill in the spaces between the bigger refractory particles and hence the overall porosity decreases then as because the apparent porosity is decreasing if the porosity is decreasing volume is decreasing and hence the bulk density will increase bulk density has increased maximum that is for b4 sample so b4 sample is the best sample here which is having the highest values and all and cold crushing strength similarly from the figure it is mentioned it is quite clear that increasing the amount of expanded graphite has increases the cold crushing strength uh, increase in the cold pressing strength is again because of the better filling of the pores and it will result in increasing the bulk density. So for B4 sample, again, the best pore filling is available and hence the cold crushing strength is also increasing. Now there is another implementation that is submicron graphite. Submicron graphite, you know, these are very smaller in size as compared to flaky graphite, leading to the more even distribution. For traditional refractories, the graphites are too large, I have said here, and it cannot fill in all the voids, and hence flaky graphites are um, quite replaced by some submicron graphites. Here, this first two structure represent the flaky graphite, and these are the submicron graphites. The uh, scale range you can see, if the size is 30 micrometer here, here it is 1 micrometer. And if this is 10 micrometer and this is 500 nanometer, so the sizes you can see these are quite smaller in size and it will fill up the pores completely. These are the things it will lead to the more even distribution and all. So here also the same thing if we add some micron graphite, the apparent porosity between the larger refractory particles will uh, uh, decrease and hence the bulk density will increase. Here this first line like the dots represent the some micron carbon. So in adding the submicron carbon, the bulk density is improving, but in traditional refractories, we can see that the bulk density is decreasing. So, submicron graphite also has got a positive value. See, these are all uh, laboratory tested. Okay, these are uh, quite not applicable in industries right now, but in future, we can hope so to happen also. Nanocarbons are being used. Okay, then we can expect this to happen also. So as the pores are completely filled and we can say that a traditional in the traditional magnesium carbon refractory, the thickness of the penetration layer increases with increases in the carbon content. But for submicron content, the thickness of the penetration layer is decreasing. With increasing the carbon content, again, the cold crushing strength is increasing increasing but with traditional uh, carbon bearing refractories what we can say is uh, with uh, more and more exposure and all the cold crushing strength will uh, decrease amorphous cnt okay carbon nanotubes you have read you must have heard about this these are the cylindrical large molecules consisting of the hexagonal arrangement of sp2 hybridized carbon atoms which are formed by rolling up the uh, single sheet of graphene graphene Okay, either in single walled nanotubes or by rolling the multiple sheets of graphite, graphene. So either single walled or multi walled. So conventional magnesium graphite composite are used in the steel ladles. I hope you know about steel ladles. Um, they see the steel ladles basically don't be confused about ladles. There are ladle cars and there are steel ladles. Ladder cars are used for transferring the molten iron coming out from the blast furnace to the steel making unit and steel ladles are something which is which is used for this refining purpose like the ladder cars bring out the molten iron it will transfer it to the suppose uh, the furnace, it will transfer it to a furnace from where steel is made like the some some things are oxidized the impurities are oxidized and all and from that we can get the molten steel this steel also has got some uh, impurities and all. So this steel uh, is again poured into the ladle furnace that is steel ladle and from that we can oxidize other impurities and again it is transferred to the processing unit from which various shapes of steels are made. 
so carbon content like conventional magnesium graphite uh, composites which are used in the steel ladders has got uh, several drawbacks like limited lifetime due to slack corrosion due to rapid oxidation of carbon so carbon content is varied greatly by replacing graphite with amorphous carbon nanotubes what are car amorphous carbon nanotubes see the uh, carbon nanotubes has got a high aspect ratio so this high aspect ratio cannot be dispersed well in the matrix like if you take the example of magnesia carbon refractory it cannot be dispersed well in the matrix because it has got a high aspect ratio it cannot fill in all the pores so if we convert it into an amorphous carbon nanotubes this amorphous carbon nanotubes has got a increasing attention day by day because of its different crystal structure as compared to carbon nanotubes like crystal and carbon nanotubes the walls of the amorphous carbon nanotubes are um, composed of many carbon clusters whose characteristic is a short distance order and long range disorder amorphous thing you know about that also so amorphous carbon nanotube like you know it has got some inherited defects this defects it will improve the uh, thermal shock resistance property okay it will improve the thermal shock resistance property the thermal conductivity will decrease so it will not allow the heat to flow outside and again the amorphous cnt like you know it has got a well adhesive property to magnesia magnesia particles so it will be dispersed well in the matrix so this amorphous carbon nanotubes is quite well acquainted okay this is economical also and hence can be implemented in the industry like amorphous carbon nanotube if we use that the amount of carbon required to produce suppose you take the you take a graphite block and you take a amorphous carbon nanotube block okay the amount of carbon required to produce 1 cm cube of amorphous cnt is quite less as compared to the amount of um, amount of carbon required to produce 1 cm cube of graphite so if we add less amount of carbon then the oxidation of carbon can be prevented so that is the most important benefit of this amorphous carbon nanotube okay this two images you can see here this is the first case where we do not add amorphous carbon nanotube okay the middle center is what it is the non oxidized layer okay this is not oxidized and this outer layer is the fired and the oxidized layer so this part is completely oxidized okay this is all things are oxidized these are burnt fired okay uh, like fired in the sense you are um, li lining in the refractory and then you can see here like these all things are completely oxidized and the middle one is non not oxidized but if you add amorphous cnt what is happening the middle black portion is quite large so carbon oxidation is prevented here but here it is not prevented okay this is the uh, like difference you can see amorphous cnt is then applicable this two things you can see here this is the first case where we add amorphous carbon nanotube this is the static cup slag corrosion test if you add slag here you can see that the boundary the boundary between the slag and the refractory bit uh, refractory brick is quite clear okay it is distinct that means slag is not penetrated uh, completely like like the penetration of the slag is not well so if the slag is not penetrating then it is good for the refractory brick okay but here the boundary between the slag and the refractory it is quite hazy like there is slag penetration so slag penetration is quite uh, damaging to the refractory so this is the benefit of adding amorphous cnt and also as amorphous cnt are finer particles like this black graph is for the amorphous cnt the pore radius lies in the range of 5 to 1 nanometer okay 5 sorry 5 nanometer and all so this is good because if most of the pore radius are quite small then it is better to use amorphous cnt but in this red one you can see there are some pores which are ranging which whose sorry whose size are completely whose size are you know uh, more than uh, 5 nanometer that is nearing to about 10000 sorry 1 lakh nanometer size so matlab uh, if we add um, this uh, amorphous cnt the pore sizes are quite uh, small it will fill the pores completely and hence the proper filling of the refractory will be there there will be quite good dispersion in the matrix phase and hence this uh, it is also economical also so it is uh, quite replaceable for uh, to flaky graphite we can add amorphous cnt nano carbons are being used flaky sorry um, that what expanded graphite and submicron graphite are still in the testing stage so i guess this will be implemented soon 
Uh, with this, I have come to the end of my presentation. I'll be going with the Q and A session now.